Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Please help me welcome Carmen Develius. I think I got it right. She is the founder of Doggies for Dementia Foundation, and we're going to talk about what she does and why it's important to remove the stigma of a cognitive impairment disease. So thanks for joining me, Carmen. Ah, thank you. Wonderful to be here. So I was on And her... you were really close, <laughs> Carmen DeVelas. DeVelas. I am so <laughs> yeah, horrible. Really, really with... close. <laughs> I am so horrible with names. I'm lucky I get my own right. <laughs> oh, it's a tough one anyway. So <laughs> That's true. I had one name yeah. I could not. It was Greek, and I don't think I ever got it right, but oh. I think I stopped trying. <laughs> But thank you. I was on Carmen's show a few months back and invited her to come talk on us. So tell us about you and how you got involved with or why you created the Foundation Doggies for Dementia. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, where do I begin, (laughs) Jennifer? (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, 40 years, I was a nurse, 20 of those nurse practitioner, and my specialty uh, toward the the last couple decades, <laughs> that's, that's so funny to say decades. Last couple decades, I uh, was in elder care, you know, um, and a lot of that was dementia care, and especially the last um, the last fit, ten years or so was really specifically supporting families impacted by dementia. And you know, I just came to realize there's only, there's only so much I could offer in support. Uh, you know, whatever kind of resources we had, which, as you know, especially, say, 15 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, really limited, very limited um, and very there's no cure. You know, we had some medications to help. And other than, you know, being present and listening uh, were probably some of the greatest gifts. And um, I did house calls also during that time, which. I particularly loved because it's a com- it's a complete change in dynamics. Uh, people aren't coming to my home, if you want to call a clinic a home. I'm going to their setting and witnessing what they're talking about in a whole different perspective. And um, yeah, and that was really a start. That was when the wheels started turning. I'll just say that. <laughs> well, I used to have a geriatrician talk quarterly on the show she's gotten very busy so and she's also in the uk so getting connected is a lot more challenging but she does the same thing she will go to somebody's home especially somebody that's had repeated falls and she posted on instagram once this gentleman was a former antiques dealer and he had all these beautiful throw rugs in his home. He had throw rugs on top of throw rugs, which looked really nice. It wasn't just like a pile of rugs. And mm-hmm. I, I, I think I got five of the six tripping hazards that she was noticing. Yeah. And it's, you yes. know, it, it makes a huge difference to actually see people in their own environment. And I, I wish yeah, we could get back to that, but I don't know. There's a lot of other problems to solve first. Yeah, you know, it depends. It, some areas there's quite a there are quite a few providers that do, but it's still limited. And um, but it really makes a world of difference, a world of difference. Because you know, when we see things over and over, and it's our environment, we really can't see the forest for the trees. You know, it's like that's just the way it is. And you don't stop and think, oh wow, that's really dangerous or that could be really dangerous, or that's contributing. And a new set of eyeballs on the situation, big difference. And somebody that's coming in to help eyeball situations, not, you know, I know that also with some of the followers that I have on, on the social media stuff, you know, sometimes these people come in and they're looking, it's like they have check boxes they got to fill in, you know, Mm -hmm. is this safe? you know, is the kitchen safe? Are there grab bars? Are there this other, but they don't, They don't approach it as, you know, like, you know, it's kind of like, did you baby proof the house? Well, yes and no. You know, it's, it's not like they don't come in with a warm and fuzzy. Their intentions are excellent, but the execution sometimes leaves people feeling a little beat up. Yeah. 
Well, and you know what? That's a really good point, Jennifer, because one of the things I loved about it, that I was a guest in their home. I wasn't there to challenge. I was really there to support and to take in. I'm taking in what they're telling me. And then like, okay, so this is a problem. What are our options? And what's doable? What's really doable? And uh, it really changed the, and, you know, coming from nursing, it's more holistic body, mind, and spirit, looking at all the connections and things and being in someone's home made a world of difference. I know after my dad died and it was assumed my mom would come live with me, which thankfully I knew before I even considered that option, that that was not a good option. But we had things like, you know, our old home backed up to hundreds of acres of open space and Mm -hmm. you could literally lean against the countertop or against the cabinetry in the kitchen and turn on the gas stove. Like, I don't know how you meant it. You could lean against it and poof, it was on. So it was definitely not dementia friendly. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, you know, it was a single story home, wide hallways, it was either carpet or tile, so there wasn't a lot of transitions on the flooring. But, you know, it's just like there's just certain things, you know, just you don't think of. And it was huge. So it was like yeah. she could have gotten lost in certain rooms. And it just, you know, you look at it, you think, oh, this is a safe house. But when you look at it with somebody's, you know, impairments in mind, it's like a whole different story. So mm-hmm. we kind of we thought about that when we bought the new house, but we did you know, it's, it's got every, all the living space is upstairs. It's my office. That's, you know, downstairs. It's almost like a basement, but we don't do basements in California. So, you know, there's just so much to consider. It's also one of the reasons that I tell people, you know, when you get into your, you know, mid to late eighties and you're retired, um, you'd be crazy not to, you know, consider an assisted living community. Cause why the heck do you want to like cook and clean and maintenance and, you know, and you got to drive to the grocery store and you, oh, it's like, there's so many things involved in maintaining a house. Don't do yeah, it. There is. Yeah. Let somebody yeah, else do don't it. Don't do it. <laughs> my husband was, don't do it. Yeah. My husband was gone for 10 days and I was like, well, the dogs reminded me that I was forgetting to give them their joint treats. They will um, not let you forget if you've missed their meal by a minute, you, you will know. <laughs> um, yeah. But then the things like yeah. watering the herbs on the kitchen counter, making sure the trash gets out to the street, you know, so that it gets picked up really early on Friday morning. It's like just like a hundred little annoying things that, you know, I deal with my stuff. He deals with his stuff. So when I had to combine them all, I was like, this is really a pain in the butt. <laughs> and I don't think people consider like how, how much time that takes. So, yeah. Yeah. So have you seen an improvement in dementia care in the last 10, 15 years? You know, I have been out of the clinical world for about six years now. So it's hard for me to speak to that. However, I'm still in the uh, the world of dementia, if you will. And I would say there have been some, okay, resources, number one, let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah, big climb, big climb and resources that are out there and ways to reach people because social media for one, I mean, just do a little search on Instagram and families can find, can find us, for instance, you know, both of us are on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I think that's how I found you in fact, or we found each other. And, you know, so that is, is a big thing. And since families and now with relation to dementia, and this is one of the things that you know, we're trying to change that stigma and that of being afraid to speak up and even maybe even say, you know, that a family member has Alzheimer's or or dementia, for instance, another form of dementia. If they're afraid to speak up, how are they going to get help? Right. And so once people start talking about it, then the younger generations get involved and friends and they're just like, Hey, I was on Facebook and I saw X, Y, Z. Right. True. And, and so that, and I, and I think that that can be the difference between a, almost like a successful journey and a really struggling, struggling journey. Because it's it's not easy. No, no doubt about it. It's not easy. Not at all. 
The one yeah. thing I noticed, because I'm a Gen Xer, so, you know, we're always in the middle of everything. <laughs> and or we're between the millennials and the boomers, right? So mm-hmm. I, I find it fascinating that the older generation just, they're almost, they're really appalled by the younger generation. You're skipping the Gen Xers like me again, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, like the, the boomers don't want, they don't want to talk about it because they're trying to be respectful for their loved one. And, you know, it's like Alzheimer's is, you know, it's definitely not a great thing to have. Um, I guess, you know, probably what, 30, 40 years ago, cancer was kind of a similar stigma. But then you've got the younger generation that grew up with social media and they just put it all out there. Right. And I think you're right. I think because they're connecting online with other younger caregivers that they help each other through social media. So it's definitely, I mean, I get why some people are appalled because sometimes I'm like, really? Like I'm over you Mm -hmm. posting mom eating or this, or, you know, it's like sometimes like, okay, okay. I know you guys do that. I'm, you know, a couple panels of that is enough. Um, But, you know, just, I find it really interesting. The two, two generations are so vastly different, but I think it's important to be able to talk about it and understand that that's not being disrespectful to your loved one because everybody's going to need support and help. And that's, that's nothing to be ashamed about. So that's yeah. kind of what doggies for dementia is trying to address. Correct. The foundation. Right. So, you know, I, you mentioned cancer and I'll just say from the get go, I realized I, I, I left my practice and I, I wrote a book sharing 13 family stories and the one common thread and that I heard was the isolation, the loneliness. And my next question then, you know, internally is like, well, why is that? Why is it? And I, and it's like, well, people don't know, people don't understand and what we don't know or understand we will shy away from and retreat and or say, well, I don't know what to say, so I don't come around. I want to remember them the way they were. I'm afraid. I don't want to go there. And what happened was families then were just kind of abandoned and felt abandoned, which was a double pain on top of every, even more than double, because not only were they feeling that people didn't want to be with them, that feel almost like the kid in the playground that doesn't get chosen it's a pain that goes deep right and like we've been rejected by people we loved and then we're also lonely and we're dealing with this we don't know what to do and it was for for you know it it can run very deep and be as harmful as any physical and and it reminded me like in the days since I'm an old nurse right and I thought in the beginning in my practice when I was in my 20s and even 30s breast cancer, you didn't say breast cancer, you didn't say cancer. It was like the C word, it was quiet. And women suffered alone because they couldn't really come out and say it. And family members were like, oh, breast cancer, you know, because it's breast. And, and I thought, you know, what changed that was that courageous women shared their stories. And loving, supportive people stood beside them and said, you know what, this is heartbreaking, but there's also strength and beauty and courage and joy in these moments to say that it's not happening. It's a denial of real life. And I thought about that in relation to dementia care. I'm like, all right, that's what we have to do too. That's what we need to do. We need to make it real life and show both sides, you know, yes, it's heartbreaking. Yes, it's difficult. However, there's still a person there with all the beautiful, joyful, challenging, <laughs> all the quirks that all of us have. Yep. And, and sometimes and then, they develop new ones. <laughs> yes. And the new ones. And, and what, and, you know, to me, reading stories of inspiration are life-changing for me because I read that or I would hear a story and it would change how I viewed my world. I'm like, oh, hold on here a second. I don't know why I'm whining about this because (laughs) it could be so much worse. Or how would I deal with that? 
Or in my case, at the time when I was writing my book, you know, I thought I was, I was, you know, in the families and the couples. And I thought, gee, I wonder if my husband would stand by me the way I'm seeing these couples do that. You know, and it brought up conversations, really important and disappointing, <laughs> you might, might guess, but conversations, because that's that's real life. And, you know, I, I just got so involved in it and I thought, Oh, Oh my gosh, we could change this. We can change this. Have you mm-hmm. seen the book before the diagnosis? There's actually two now. I believe so. Okay. I've read so many. So yeah, <laughs> well, I don't always remember the titles, but I remember stories. Well, this one is all essays of from caregivers like myself. Cause I have an essay about my mom in the second edition, it's all about who they were before. And it was really, it was, I wrote it after my mom passed away and I um, struggled because it's like my mom had dementia, you know, Alzheimer's for 20 years. So like I had to really go back way back. I had to to go to the way back machine and, and remember things. And, you know, it was, it was really nice. And then when it came, it came right around like, just a week or so before the second anniversary of her passing. And I read it and I was like, wow, what a nice legacy. I mean, I'm not patting myself Mm -hmm. on the back, but you know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, interestingly in that it was part of what doggies for dementia does, we photograph, you know, we're there photographing. And the reason the doggies for dementia is we include dogs, the family dog or familiar dog, because it creates this kind of neutral really kind of fun rather than being on the spot, getting your picture taken, uh, for instance, and then their stories. And um, one of the things every family has said is that, you know, I didn't realize how important it was to continue the story on and what it would feel like. Just like you said, you know, I created this kind of added to that legacy and to say, yeah, this is really important. It is important. And, you, you know, you don't want that to end when a person passes. You know, those stories are important. <laughs> you hear my dogs. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Mine are snoring on the I'm floor. Sure well, they're, that is. <laughs> they're not snoring, but they're they're yeah. quite content. One's sleeping on the yeah. couch and one is laying on the floor. Anybody that's followed uh, me on, on Instagram has seen my dogs plenty of times. But one of the yeah, things... <laughs> yeah. One of the yeah. things that... You know, because I do this podcast and I tell people, you know, like, it seems like I think the AI on my phone understands, like, I can type my mom and then it'll auto-populate with had Alzheimer's for 20 years. And it's like, but she died at 77. So can we talk about the other 57 years? Right. I think I'm doing the math right. (laughs) Okay, Math's not my thing. And, you know, so it's the one thing that my dad did before he passed away was they continued the tr- their Christmas tradition of the, the he and my mom and their poodle would do a, f- a portrait every year to put <laughs> in with their Christmas letter. And that got more and more challenging. And I will share the one, one of the last ones where I said something, you know, like saucy, sarcastic to get my mom to laugh. And she did. And when you look at this photograph, you would not... <laughs> not believe me if I told you my mom was in the mid to later stages of Alzheimer's. You'd be like, Mm -hmm. well, you might believe me, but it would give you a false impression of what Alzheimer's looks like because whatever, I don't remember what I said, but it made her eyes light up and it put a smile on her face. Mm -hmm. So she looked the way she did that I had known for years. And it's, and then it just kept getting harder. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know, one of the things I found by adding dogs And the reason I even, uh, two things, one, by adding dogs, like for the photos that are in my book, the families, the ones who had their family dog were the most popular on social media. And beyond popularity, what that meant to me was people were stopping and reading the stories and commenting and saying, I had no idea. I thought it looked like a person in a nursing home in a wheelchair kind of bundled up by the window, not being able to talk. I had no idea. It could be someone younger or just, you know, you name it. They had no idea. And I thought, okay, well, let's go where the people are and dogs. 
And then, of course, there's no doubt about when you have a dog in it, the attention is changed and the mood is changed and, and it can go anywhere, which is really OK. You know, photographer, we I don't care where it goes. I'm kind of happy to capture that moment and those candid looks and smiles and um, or, you know, who knows what what we're going to find that is real life because that's happening right then. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's real. And, um, these pretty soon forget that I'm there with the lights and the camera and, and I'm there, you know, doing what I'm doing. Plus it's fun for me. And you know what? Life's too short not to have fun. That is very (laughs) true. I'm really quite in my element. um, doing what I do. Mm -hmm. I was always surprised when I was doing my photography, when people were, they were hesitant to ask if they could bring the family dog. I'm like, oh yeah, sure. Occasionally I would be smart enough to ask them what breed. Not that it generally yeah. mattered, but, um, you know, sometimes, or sometimes they'd like, I did, um, what was that dog? Not a great day. And it was bigger than that. And it wasn't an Irish wolf helmet. It was this huge dog. Great, great Pyrenees. Um, no, it was a bull mastiff. I think he weighed 240 oh. pounds. <laughs> I'm like this dog weighs more than I do. <laughs> so you bring in a pony to the photo shoot. And there was two of them. That was the male yeah. and the female weighed almost um, as much as I did. And it was just, I mean, it was just the craziest thing. And I just, I yeah. loved doing family portraits with pets, mostly dogs, because yeah. cats aren't super cooperative, as you probably know. Yeah. But it, yeah, well, it's for doggies and not kitties, <laughs> pretty much, you know. Yeah, cats so usually, cats, cats scratch, because yeah. I, the, one of the, the last, portraits I did of my parents, I did at their house and we incorporated my dad's cat and she was not having it. And he, she scratched him and he had diabetes and other issues and that was not great. But, you know, I tried to get them to interact with the pets or just be natural, but my dad was very much into the posy pose picture. (laughs) Oh, oh. You, you know, what it happens, you just can't, can't resist is that there's a certain level of affection and vulnerability with pets because they're all accepting, right? D- with dogs. Let's talk about dogs. I don't know about cats, but, um, and so you can capture those moments of affection and, and caring and love with the, with the dog, you may not capture between people. And then it kind of frees people up to join in others or to look on with that look of, oh, that's so sweet. Well, that's perfection. That is true. It's like, okay, all right. And then, you know, the stories become memorable as well. The photo sessions are memorable for people. They'll say this was like one of the most wonderful things, time that we've spent with mom or dad and each other, even siblings, you know, not, not always do people get along or agree. And if everyone deals with things in their own way and, uh, but to spend some time where everybody's right and nobody's wrong and everybody's right, doesn't matter. You know, we're just there to have a good time. Well, and, and it's nice um, to document something other than, you know, going back to the social media posts of, It's nice to see somebody living with some form of dementia, living pretty, pretty well, you know, not struggling, not causing grief, not throwing a hissy fit in the, you know, target or whatever, you know, the stuff that people share because, Hey, we, you need to know how hard this is. So it is nice to see the flip side of the coin, but yeah, it's the, I was, I was really pleased. My mom when she lived in memory care, they, they had the, you know, the assisted living community was attached and the salon gal would go to the memory care residents and pick up anybody that had an appointment. And about September of 2019, my mom refused to go with this gal. She tried a couple times and I was just like, I am not going with you to sit in the dark corner, you know, during our, our visit, because, you know, your back's to me. She doesn't even know I'm there. So I, I really tried hard not to have to be that person just sitting there. But I was visiting and she was literally like brushing her bangs out of her face continuously. I'm like, okay, it's time to get her hair cut. And so I told myself, I'm like, okay, well, if I have to, (laughs) I have to sit in the corner while she gets her hair done, 
I'm bringing my gear and I was going to, I think I did bring one of my studio lights, but when I got there, she was wearing a fairly colorful shirt. It's not something I would have chosen for a portrait, but I was smart enough not to ask her to change. And I looked out <laughs> in the courtyard. It was, um, this was December 9th, 2019. And, you know, this, the trees were all changing colors. So the trees matched her shirt fairly well. So I'm like, okay, well, you can't really ask for a better background that, that coordinates like so well with, with her shirt that I would not have chosen for a portrait, you know, and the gal, they, you know how the hairdressers always dry. It's so nice. And yeah. I got literally <laughs> five shots. Three of them are really nice. Two of them are okay. And that was December 9th, 2019. My mom fell on December 30th and unbeknownst to everybody at the time, she um, fractured her pelvis. I kept taking her to the doctor because she was having pain walking. And then she fell March 8th, broke her leg, and died March 31st. So I was so pleased with myself that I didn't let my annoyed caregiver, why do I have to put up with this nonsense <laughs> attitude, prevent me from doing that? Because that is, you would not know that she was months away from passing away. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day. And you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, your your points well taken. And um, I one of the things that I try to say in a way that's not so... Um, morbid. <laughs> oh yeah. Thank you. That's the word is, you know, now is the time because you just don't know. However, you know what, that's the case for all of us. I mean, I, I, my mentor, I remember photography, she was talking about a family portrait that she did over the holidays and the dad and the kids, and it was chaos and they got their photos. And two weeks later, the, the father was killed in a car accident. And those photos meant beyond what anyone could have imagined, right? And um, even last year with, uh, as it is now still, but with the uh, precautions and safety, and um, it's been difficult to photograph, see people in for uh, for us and memory cares and things. There was a time between what the Delta and the Omicron or the other way around, but anyway, it was a break and, and, um, I went in and I, 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 uh, photographed four different families and five during that time, but out of those five, three had gone on to have serious health issues, non COVID related, but it, it doesn't matter. Three serious health issues. They, they wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been the same, nor would they have, it, it would have been completely altered if we could have done it at all. And we couldn't have predicted that. 
So that was like in November and by December I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm trying to get scheduled. I'm like, cause I return, I return and show them their photos and meet with them again. And we photograph that too. Cause sometimes that is as precious as during the session. And, and we kept getting rescheduled and then I'm hearing them go, well, mom fell or mom has kidney disease or, and she's on hospice now and, and these things. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And like, you have no idea how much it meant that we did that. And so, um, I could probably do an entire podcast episode on families that had a portrait done and then somebody passed away. I'll, I have one that's similar to the story you told that. So there was a, a, I had a really good client. He and his wife had split up. I don't remember. They'd been split up for a long time. And he would bring in these old Olin Mills portraits and he'd be like, (laughs) I want to recreate this pose. And the ex-wife would come and the adult sons would come and he, and he, he split it up. So he would do like his immediate family and then he would do like him and one son's family. And, you know, then another time would be the other son and that family. And I'm like, you know, we can do all this at once. You know, like Uh save yourself a little money, you know, bring different outfits. We don't have to make them look like you did everything at the same time. But no, that is how he wanted to do it. And one day the one of the oldest of the two sons walked in and I forgot what he said to me. I think I must ask him how dad was, or he asked me a question. It might've been about the somewhat recent portraits we had just done. Dad had gone out for a walk and didn't come back. And they found him basically face down on the pavement in the grass and he I mean he must have had massive heart attack and died and it's just like I remember this I mean that was prior to 2005 because my parents retired from their their version of the portrait studio and and one hour photo lab I took over in 2003 and moved it to my hometown for two years I overlapped which was very confusing for the vendors They'd ask me which business I was calling for all the time. (laughs) But I mean, I had, you know, I had a nine-year-old client. I photographed them late summer and right before Thanksgiving. She'd had, she'd been born with a heart defect and she went in for just like basic maintenance for lack of a better, I'm sure you have a better term than I'm using. And she told her, her teacher, she goes, well, if I don't come home, I don't come back to school. It's because I became an angel. And they can choke me up and my daughter is 30 and this girl was the same age. So we're talking like 21 years ago, 20 years ago. And she died. And it was like, when I found out, I went in the office and pulled out the negatives and cried. It was like, oh my God, it's like still chokes me up. Yeah. And it's, yeah, you know, yeah. and I'm sure you, well, you, you didn't do this professionally, but I'd have people say, well, I'm going to schedule a family portrait when I lose 20 pounds. And I'm like, well, yeah, then you'll just be older. Which, oh, that, well, in the last six years, I've heard that a lot. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> oh, you know. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, but. I can pose yeah, you. F- the time is now, the time is now, the time is now. And yeah, and, you know, I would just say along this, you know, we're we're in Austin, to, I'm in Austin, Texas, and that's, but we traveled some to do the portraits. And, um, you know, fortunately, I, Alzheimer's Foundation of America awarded us a grant so that we are adding photographers around the country and are able to photograph families around the country. Because that the thing we're the very thing we're talking about, just how fragile and valuable life is now, is like on my mind all the time. I'm like, what can we do? What can we do? We, you know, this is so. Is um, of, of times I've spoken and you've shown the photos and the stories. There's usually a few people there crying really hard. And they're not crying. And I thought at first the pictures are are making them sad for some reason, or they're too vulnerable, or and each time it's because they're like, it's too late for me. I can't do this for my mom or my dad because they passed, or I didn't think about it. I wish I had thought about it. It didn't even cross my mind. Why would I want pictures of that time? And you know, along those lines, and I thought, okay, okay. Um, it is it is just that important, just that important. And you just never know. It, like my daughter's getting married bef- after, before this, well, we're recording, she's getting married this weekend. This will come <laughs> out after she gets married. 
And she doesn't like the way she looks. She's heavier than she wants to be because she's got an autoimmune disease that, you know, that and lifestyle habits, you know, but I used to weigh over 200 pounds as well. And it's like, I would do family portraits. I liked actually being the really overweight photographer because I would tell people, well, you know, I can pose you to look really good because you can't trust a skinny photographer, right? <laughs> 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 and, I couldn't, and then I'm trying to remember, I actually had to show a client an old picture of me because I told her I weighed over 200 pounds and she just looked at me like I was like just feeding her a line and... I showed her and, I, and she goes, this picture is really nice. I'm like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Like, you know, <laughs> you don't put the bigger person in front of the smaller person because they're just going to look bigger and the small person's going to disappear. So, and I've said, and I can do some stuff with Photoshop too, but it's mostly posing and, you know, and then the- There are some tricks to the tray, that's yeah, for sure. You know, trust me, yes. not if, everybody is not a model and your family doesn't uh -huh. care if you weigh 200 pounds or, you know, you got wrinkles and- because when we do like the extended family portraits, you know, I always mm -hmm. did mom, you know, like the the elder, like the originals of the family, mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, whomever, whichever direction we're going with that. And a lot of times the older adult woman would be like, oh, nobody wants a picture of me at this stage of my life. And it's like, uh. you're right. They don't necessarily want a picture right now, but they're going to want one later. And you, and, and then I would just look at them like, you know what I mean, right? Uh huh. You know what I'm talking about. They're going to want this after you're mm -hmm. dead. But I never had to <laughs> tell them that. I would just tell them they're going to want it later. And then 99% of the time, the light bulb would click on. And they'd be like, yeah. oh, okay. Or sometimes they'd say, you know, like, Carmen, you're going to want a picture of me when I'm dead. <laughs> so funny. Uh -huh. Oh, my gosh. Well, I, I remember my sister-in-law sent me a picture of um, my son me, my son, and my two nieces when they were all little. And so my son's 35 now. My nieces are in their 20s. And I remember the day that was taken. I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm wearing my mom jeans. My hair is a mess. I'm feeling, you know, fat. I was like 20 pounds ago, right? And I'm thinking, I look back and I thought, I looked really good. <laughs> what was I thinking? You know, and I thought maybe that's the case now that when I get to be 83, I'm going to look back and go, why did I complain when I was 63? What was wrong with me? And that, you know, again, it just goes back to like the time is now. And um, moms as a rule, you know, we are the ones usually photographing our kids although maybe things have changed with selfies and stuff. But when I gathered up photos for my son's high school graduation, great photos of him his whole life. And he's like, mom, where are you? What did you look like when I was this age? I'm like, well, I was behind the camera and I was probably thinking, oh, it's not the perfect day for me or what have you, you know? So yeah, nope, the time is now. The time is now. Well, after my dad passed away and mom went to memory care, it dawned on me pretty quickly that if I did not continue to photograph her, that she would literally disappear from family archives of photos and stuff. It, it would be like she and my dad died at the same time. So I made an effort yeah. to chronicle some of the stuff she was doing in memory care um, with her dog and yeah. with the other Dianes, which most of my listeners know my mom was one of a trio of three Dianes, if that's not confusing enough. As you know, I'm really bad with names. So we had Diane, other Diane, and other, other Diane. <laughs> and it was just, it was, you know, you know, I, I finally stopped asking my mom where her friend Diane was because it just confused the daylights out of her. But sometimes they'd laugh and they'd do things. And it's like, you know, it's different than what I wish she was doing. You know, I wish she was traveling and, and doing all the things that my dad always kind of throw through, you know, cold water on. But this is the way it is, and I I don't regret I regret ha not having more images. I was I tried to be very respectful and not capture the more negative stuff. There was some things I did to share to show that this is what advanced Alzheimer's looks like. But I was nothing like that other generation after me that photographs and videos everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I will say we photograph people at all different stages. Um, it, you know, it's families who contact us and say we'd like to do so all stages. And I have some like stuffed dogs that I might use that breathe and look real if someone's really fragile or what have you. Um, it, but every story becomes just so important. And we've had a good number of people with early onset Alzheimer's who can tell us what it's like from their own personal perspective and and uh, both their stories and the images and um, all really valuable though. You know, it goes back to that it's the journey and it could be heartbreaking. And, and I think when it comes from a place of love and compassion and uh, what you're, what you're, What's your reason for doing it, right? That's always the case. What, what's your subject and why? What are you trying to say? And if it's to say this is the caregiver's journey and that is the difficulties of it and things, that's that purpose. And um, we are, yes, that's true, but we're also trying to show the many different faces of dementia so that when we when people think about Alzheimer's, their first thought doesn't go to that late stage, you know, like person on hospice um, who's you know near death to to stop and say, wait a second, this person has fifty and they're out there playing basketball. They have Alzheimer's, no way. No. Nope. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. We, and, um, we need one of those moving. I don't know, like tributes. Like everybody can, can contributes a you know like the photo I just talked about earlier about my mom that I did the last time she had a nice you know haircut and and her hair was dried nice I mean I don't think her other original hairdresser dried her hair that nice <laughs> um, you know and I have pictures so my youngest golden retriever my oldest one that also passed away during the pandemic he did not like the memory care I took. My youngest golden retriever, who is the most gentle, loving soul, he was a rescue. And so uh, he has kind of a different personality. I don't know if we're projecting onto him, but I took him once with me to visit mom and the ladies there loved him. I was not sure I was going to be able to get out of there. I was mildly concerned that he would be overwhelmed and exhausted because everybody was petting him and talking to him. And, you know, he wears the pinch collar when he's on his leash because he's pretty stubborn. Um, he mm -hmm. likes to throw his shoulders into it and just walk really fast, and, <laughs> which is good because my husband's 6'2", so my husband can walk fast with them. I don't do that. But this mm -hmm. one lady, she was so sweet. She was very perturbed that I had this horrible collar on her dog. <laughs> And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> how am I going to get oh, my she... dog home? <laughs> she, <Yes. laughs> was, she was giving me instructions about this dog. And, oh, my gosh, it was hysterical. But he just sat there, and he was super calm, and he just let them love on him. The wheelchairs didn't freak him out. And as far as I know, he's never experienced people in wheelchairs before. Nobody in my home had had one of those. Um, I never did get to take the girly dog, who's almost eight, She's a little bit more demanding on attention. She will swat you and and she basically smacks you with her paw and then like pulls the paw back. So like she's trying to pull your hand, but sometimes she hits your leg and if she hits bare skin, it's not comfortable. So I was uh, hesitant that she might do that with an older adult with more fragile skin. But hopefully one of these days I might have the opportunity to see if she would actually be a lot more mellow because they're really great around little kids that they never grew up with either. They're very, very good with little kids. So I, be I bet you they'd be good with older adults too. So it's just the, the bond people have with a dog, it doesn't even have to be theirs. And like you said, sometimes mm -hmm. you bring, you bring other people's dogs and you bring the animatronic dogs. Yeah. So it's a familiar dog is what we ask for. So um, sometimes it's a community dog if it's in a long-term care community. So they're familiar and they're, you know, obviously um, that because safety is our, is our important too, as you just talked about. Right. And, um, and then other times it's a family dog, you know, now that things are starting to open up again, if there are, there are various um, therapy dogs that can come in that, that'll work too. 
and yeah, we have the the various uh, stuffed animals that I have. It depends which one a person's going to like. And we never have quite know how that's going to go. The last couple of times has been quite wonderful. They're just thrilled with that. And and so that's that's the um, that's that's the goal that we have. We have uh, um, an enjoyable time. So how do people yeah. find out about you, get some photos done with you? Or maybe if there's photographers listening like myself, how do you... Yeah. How could they get involved? Like how, how do yes. we help spread the word and, <laughs> and reduce the stigma like we've been talking about for this whole whole time today? Yeah. yeah, let's change. I just say like one image takes one image that can change the world. And I know that sounds just so trite, but it's true. You know, I mean, I could think of a lot of classic images that made huge impacts on the world. And I think we can, too. Um, yeah, so doggiesfordementia.org is our website and there's contact there. So photographers that might be interested, that's a good contact as well as families. And then just send out the information and it is free for families. The sessions are free, sharing their stories. We write blogs and um, obviously we're pretty active on social media. So uh, Facebook and Instagram, Doggies for Dementia. Uh, you'll see pictures of me and Sparky, my dog, who doesn't make the cut to go visit, but we, we have a new rescue that I think will. But um, you can find us through social media as well. Um, email is Carmen at doggiesfordementia.org. And um, those are really the best ways. And you might think like this is a big organization and you know, gosh, we're but the person that's going to answer is going to be me. <laughs> we do have a board. We're a nonprofit, 501c3. We're a nonprofit and we have, a, you know, board of directors and, and things. However, I'm the one that's really the one behind the computer and making things happen and and um, you're the whole team and organizing. I'm the team right now. Now that's changing. Thank you, Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Because we got we we yes, uh, that's our first big grant, and it's a nice national grant, and it's it's allowing us to expand and to get assistance to help uh, so that we can grow and and do it in the right way and gracefully. I say gracefully yeah. <laughs> and, and and grandly, and you know because we want to do it right and. You you know, we want to support our photographers out there and and our families, of course. And, you know, I've had I mean, we have traveled. All I have to say to my husband is like there's someone in in Georgia and he's packing the car, oh. you know. And so, yeah, so we've as best we could during pandemic time, because we while I've been doing the work for a while, it became an official nonprofit in March of 2020, uh, which was also the beginning. Yes, of course. The, the um, month that will live in infamy. <laughs> yes, it will. Yeah. And I was diagnosed with cancer that month. I mean, it oh was just goodness. like, the, it, it was just piled on. And, and I just thought, you know what, I, that's okay. We're, we, uh, you know, we, we shared stories of what, it, what was happening during lockdown. What was it like for families at home? And um, however, now we're able to get back out and and to photograph again. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm just itching to get out there and do more. Yeah. Well, I live in a pretty big community. Uh, my husband likes to go to the clubhouse and have lunch occasionally. And there's a guy there that definitely has cognitive impairment and he goes there and eats lunch every day. And he had a little card. I forget. I think there's a photograph on one side and there's phone numbers on the back. And my husband was smart enough to take a picture <gasps> of the phone numbers which uh -huh. came in handy once. So I've seen on our, the private community Facebook pages, people asking about caregivers, which I don't know any up here yet that will change. Mm -hmm. So I might, yeah. I might dust off my, yeah. my light to my camera. And I mean, we live in a really beautiful place. We're in the um, Sierra foothills. And oh. so there's like, I look out the window, I've got a red Japanese maple tree, the green golf course, oak trees, pine trees, I mean, it's just beautiful. beautiful. Like there's a house across the golf course, but it's kind of obscured by the trees. So like, yeah. I, if I lean well, this way, I can only see half of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings up another common question. It's like, well, where do where do people, where do we photograph? I have photographed in blue bonnet fields. I have photographed in, um, which was beautiful, in uh, ranches with cows and and things and people's homes, uh, long-term care communities and the courtyard. It, 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 you know, just like you said, it's the surroundings, it, it can be anywhere. 
So, and I that, think you really need to think about dusting off your camera. <laughs> I know where it is. It's upstairs in the in the coat closet, and the light is. Yeah. I think it's down here. But you yeah. you talked about the location. When you have a good photographer, good photographer can find the pretty spot in pretty much any location. So our yes. studio was in the strip mall next to a Kmart. Kmart's not photogenic, but it had stone <laughs> archways. And yes. between the parking lot and the doors. I uh -huh. took more pictures in front of those stupid arches and people would be like, those are really pretty. Where are those? Right over there at Kmart. And they'd be like, Kmart. what? No. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, another great point, Jennifer, is that people worry about, well, where, what if I, if the place is in or my house is this? Like, don't worry. That's our worry. You know, and don't worry about what's going to happen because one of the things that's a part of us is that uh, our photographers will understand about dementia. So there really isn't anything to worry about there either. It's like, okay, we're ready. We're good. And um, so really lighten the load there. Because, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of worries that people have for a photography session. And I can guarantee you that you are not going to regret having a nice photo of your loved one, even if it's a little more candid, which I know more people mm -hmm. like these days, you won't regret it. You might, it might take you a little while to be able to look at it once they're gone. Like I can speak mm -hmm. from experience, but mm -hmm. you won't regret it. And it's, it's all part of the history. And I, that was one of my messages to people, you know, when they'd say, well, I got to lose 20 pounds or they'd come up with all these idiot excuses. I'm like, you're just going to be older, which, yeah, I can Photoshop some of that, but, you know, this is your history. You know, what mm -hmm. do you want to give to your, your family when you're gone? You know, mm -hmm. a bunch of terrible selfies or, you know, a bunch of terrible selfies, but some really nice family portraits too. So. Right. You know, right. don't, don't think it's disrespectful to photograph somebody who is not, I don't know what the right word is, who has got struggles and challenges because we all have struggles and challenges, mm -hmm. you know, just. Just do it. Be like Nike. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. And, you know, and I think to understand the perspective of the person behind the camera, because that's very vulnerable to not know where that it's a relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. And someone's got a camera pointed at you. You can't you don't know what you look like. You don't know what they're seeing. And it's a tough thing. And I like for the our our it's in our value statements and mission. We come from a place of compassion and kindness and love, period, dot. And, you know, it's like when you set the stage for that, it's like, okay, yeah, it's not, because um, it's it's hard to be in front of the camera. <laughs> it's, I think I'm going to find that out this weekend. <laughs> oh, are you? Oh, yes, you are for the wedding, right? Yeah, you know how much yeah. fun it is to call photographers because... My daughter had my daughter and her and the son-in-law are independent contractors, and one part of the company that they do less work for, they hadn't been getting paid, and they were literally owed fifteen thousand dollars in growing. So oh. I could not pry her away from that constant frustration and worry, which I know I was the same way when I was thirty. Um, so I told her, I'm like, <laughs> I can't call the wedding photographers and say. You know, I'm the mother of the bride. I'm a former wedding photographer, and this is going to be a really laid back wedding. And yeah, I'm not going to be like all up in your business. Yeah, no, I did end up having <laughs> to call the photographers, and it was, it was not easy. But I found one that I, I th hopefully it all goes well. I know all the problems with weddings, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but for a little while, because she waited so long, I'm like, I'm going to have to figure out how to do this stuff by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was oh. not happy with that, but no, we have a photographer, oh. so it's going to be really interesting to see what they get. So, yeah, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I've been married almost a year and here in a couple of weeks. And I had a friend do our photography who I liked and I, it was so nice not to think or worry about it. It was just like, Oh, nope. I just get to be, I just get to be the, one of the stars of the show. <laughs> And I'm just going to enjoy that for the day. And I just like, I could just kind of throw away my uh, worries about it. So I wish that for you so you could just have fun. That's my yeah, plan. You are, Mother of the Bride is one of the stars. You That's know, true. So. 
And I made the mm-hmm. groom's mom really happy. I think it was yesterday morning. She called to ask what color my dress was. It is navy blue, like lace over champagne underskirt, I guess is the right term. And she said, okay, so anything that's lighter than navy blue. And I'm like, if you want to wear navy blue, you go ahead. She goes, oh, thank gosh. I have, I've put on weight. She's almost the same age my parents would have been. He's the youngest of five. So, you know, his parents are almost the same age as my parents would have been. And I said, you wear whatever you, whatever you feel good in. And she's like, she's got this dress that she likes. that makes her feel good. I'm like, you wear it. And, you know, and it was, it's just so nice to be able to just, just free people of that. Cause I'm like, there's no way, even if we were wearing the same dress, if we were wearing the same dress, it would not look good. Cause we don't have the same body type, but mm-hmm. you know, it's just like, I think cause the wedding is teal and the moms are in Navy blue and the men are in dark gray. It's going to be pretty. See? Oh, that's pretty don't, nice. Don't got to stress yeah. about it. People, f- no. people get all stressed oh. about what to wear. And I notice you do a lot of black and white that takes care of a lot of color things that don't work <laughs> together. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah, I I do variation or I'll convert it over depending on what mood I'm looking to get. Um, And families are, they're also gifted the prints because I think the print, having a print uh, versus the digital file is so important and um, to have that to hold and to look at. And and you're right, they've become, I mean, some, I've been to many, celebrations of life or you know services after people pass and when I see those photos front and center and I've had family members who I'd never met who came up to me to go you're that Carmen right <laughs> like, I hope it's for a good reason I'm like yes yeah. <laughs> you no know, it is those others like oh my goodness if we didn't have these the last ones were from 20 30 years ago yeah these, that's just I mean, the world, that's just crazy. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So prints are important. We, we deliver those too. Yeah. yeah. Just for the people yes, that are listening, that's, that's a whole other skill set. getting them printed. Right. That's, <laughs> I was the same way. I'm like, yeah. you, you can buy digital files, but you got to get prints too. And I'd get explain why. And they'd be like, uh-huh, I get it. And then they'd like so many, they'd be like, can we just buy the digital files? Be like, oh my God, I hate this conversation. <laughs> uh-huh. It is a conversation, isn't it? For photographers. It's a common, <laughs> it's a common thread of, oh my goodness. I get it being, you know, having been a client too, but having yeah, it, it's like memories line your walls and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're, yeah. we're working on that in this new house. I have more artwork than, I don't have more artwork than walls. It's just, you know, you got to change it up and. Yeah. It's like new house, new placement for things and changing. It's just, you know, it's fun, but. Yeah. Well, this has been really fun. I like dogs and Thank photography you. and dementia. That's like my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk for hours. <laughs> can we? I know. Well, the it's website is linked in the episode notes and Carmen's Instagram account. You can find it there. So definitely go check out there the photos and stuff that she posts. When this episode comes out, I will share the pictures of Remy at the memory care and the picture of my mom and dad and Misty that I love so much. It is behind me, but you can't see it because I use a green Mm -hmm. screen now. And if I grab it, I will disappear momentarily and it looks really weird. (laughs) (laughs) It's alien-like, Yeah, it's very strange. And I have this, oh, you can see this green cup that disappears. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I forget that it's... It's the same color so as the screen. High tech. Yeah, it's like it's wait, so high tech. Yeah, it's like crazy, but it's you know, I, it's nice to be able to throw in a light-hearted episode that also talks about you know why you should do pictures of your loved one and mm-hmm. and why you should share the stories because you know somebody else might be hesitating and it's just yeah. might help them find the help they need. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. my favorite topics too. <laughs> <laughs> and we could be here all day. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.